Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How many of you in your dealings with other people have ever had a personality conflict? Can I see your hands? Personality conflict? Okay, and I guess the rest of you don't deal with people, is that right? Come on, all of us, whether we want to admit it or not, all of us have had the misfortune of not being able to connect with another person, not able to create that all-important meaning of the minds. Now, I contend that you can create a lot more rapport with people, quicker, deeper, and longer lasting, based on how well you practice the golden rule. Now, all of us are probably familiar with, how many of you are familiar with the golden rule? Can I see your hands? The golden rule, very simply stated, is do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Is that correct? Basically, treat people the way you want to be treated. Now, I have to tell you, I believe in that rule 110% when it comes to values, ethics, honesty, consideration. There's no better rule. But when it comes to one-to-one -one communication, when it comes to one-to-one -to -one selling, it can and actually often does backfire. Now, I learned that firsthand having grown up in Manhattan, in New York City, Brooklyn, and Jersey. First 18 years of my life, I eventually moved to San Diego, California. Now, would you agree that San Diego, California has a very different regional culture than New York, New Jersey. What do you think? Yeah, but when I moved there to San Diego, I practiced the golden rule when I, when I dealt with people. I treated the people in San Diego the way I wanted to be treated. In other words, I treated the people in San Diego as if they were New Yorkers. Do you see a potential problem here? I came on too strong, too fast, too aggressive, too in your face. Even when I ask people to do things, that under any other circumstance they would have willingly done. They dug in their heels, decided not to do it. And it wasn't because of what I was asking them to do, it was simply because of how was my approach. So I decided to look for another approach. I eventually came up with a concept called the Platinum Rule. The Platinum Rule very simply stated it's a twist a twist on the golden rule. Platinum rule says, do unto others the way they want to be done unto. In other words, treat people the way they want and need to be treated. What does that mean? It means to talk to people in ways that make it easy for them to listen. It means to sell people the way they're comfortable buying, not necessarily the way you're comfortable selling. We're gonna talk about three things. Number one, what are the differences in behaviors, uh, behavioral styles? Number two, how do you identify somebody's style quickly and accurately? And then number three, how do you adapt? How do you adjust? How do you practice the platinum rule? How do you really treat people the way they want and need to be treated? Now, it's not just in face-to-face -face selling, but over the phone, email, voicemails. Here's an example. Years ago, I was doing something with a speaker that many of you might know, a gentleman named Brian Tracy. And he was allowing people to take my online disc assessment for free. Now all they got was just a little introduction to what their style was with some sales copy, this is all online, with some sales copy to get them to convert and purchase the actual full-blown report. Well, we didn't do too well, and one of the reasons was we had the same sales copy for everybody. And then, you know, this blinding uh, 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 lightning strike of, of the obvious hit me, and I said, you know, why am I sending on, on uh, uh, the email uh, online here, why am I using the same copy for every single person when I already know what their style is? So what we did is we adjusted the sales copy based on the person's style and the results went up over 500%. Literally overnight, just by adjusting the message to the style of the individual. Now, I know that what I'm gonna talk about this afternoon, just about every single person in this room has been exposed to this concept at least once. But how many of you, second or third time, through a book or a movie, heard or saw things second or third time through that you totally missed first or second time through, anybody? 
The same thing's going to happen this afternoon. Regardless of how many times you've been exposed to this concept, I guarantee by the time I'm finished, by the time you walk out of this room, you will have some new insights, some new strategies, some new ideas that will help you adjust your message to the different behavioral types of people that you come across with and you're going to increase your effectiveness. So, people won't tell you how to treat them. Wouldn't that be great? Before we sell somebody, the person says to you, now look, look, before you go any further, let me tell you exactly what to do to close the sale. That would be too easy, wouldn't it? People won't tell you, but they'll show you. And all you need to do is monitor, at least in face-to-face -face communication, three channels of communication. The channels of communication are very simple, easy to remember. The verbal channel, those are the words that people use. The vocal channel, how they articulate those words, so the volume, the speed, the pitch, the emphasis, and then the visual channel. Now obviously, in, let's say, online communication, we primarily have the verbal, but actually the vocal too. And the vocal is how you punctuate uh, capitalize, uh, you know, the way you write a message could actually lend a vocal quality even though they can't hear it. And then the visual obviously is face to face. Verbal, vocal, visual. Verbal, we're, we're videotaping this program. Imagine if we transcribed it, sent everybody a typed transcript of my talk. That would be the verbal and the verbal only. If we gave you an MP3, that would be the verbal and vocal. How many of you would get more meaning out of this talk from reading it as opposed to hearing it? How many? Reading it. All right. How about hearing it as opposed to reading it? All right. And of course, if we sent you a DVD uh, or an MP4, now you have the verbal, the vocal, and the visual, and that's 100% of the total meaning of a message. Now, it's important to really listen, particularly to the verbal, uh, excuse me, to the vocal and the visual. But let's just take the vocal. You can take a word, and depending on how it's said, could obviously change the meaning of the word. You can say, hey, nice shirt. Or you can say, hey, nice shirt. Same words. So verbally, you would read those words as a compliment, but vocally, you would hear some sarcasm there. So watch this single word. Now it's important to listen carefully because the way you talk to people, they may interpret things not quite the way you mean them to be interpreted. So take the word O. Oh. Has no meaning whatsoever until we say the word. So watch this. Say the word O. Oh. As a group, say the word O oh to convey I understand. Oh. One more time. I understand. Oh. I don't understand. Oh. All right, so the same word vocalized differently and has exactly the opposite meaning. How about this? Say the word O oh, to convey surprise. Disappointment. Disgust. Affection. <laughs> I don't know who that was, but that was pleasure. That's dangerous. Dangerous. Verbal, vocal, visual. I'm asking you to monitor two aspects of behavior. I call them speed and temperature. Speed, how fast a person is, their pace, and temperature, uh, their priority. Are they more open or more guarded? So, I'm going to ask you to make two simple decisions when you deal with people. Decision number one, based on what I see, what I hear, what I read, do I believe the person's coming across more open or guarded? How do you tell the difference? Well, guarded people do not, and I repeat, they do not show or share their feelings or thoughts readily or willingly. In other words, they play their cards how? Close to the chest. Hard to read, limited, controlled body language and facial expressions. To the extreme, we say they have what kind of a face? A poker face. Whatever they are feeling or thinking inside tends to stay inside. They're just hard to read. 
Some people say, well, they have no emotion. No, they have emotion. It's just inside. They don't show it outside. Guarded people make decisions primarily based on facts, logic, numbers, data, documentation. Put it in writing. How many of you know somebody who basically fits that description? Can I see your hands? All right. Now, the other side, open people, just the opposite. They readily and willingly show and share their feelings and thoughts, whether you want to know them or not. These are the kind of people that you are reading, TMI, you know, too much information. You know, they, they tell you more than you want to know. They also tend to speak before they think. And in fact, it's been said about open people that their thoughts are like gumballs. They just fall to the tongue and roll out. Not unusual to leave a conversation with an open person and say to yourself, wow, whoo, what did we talk about? Because they're all over the place. They make decisions primarily based on what? Feeling, emotion, gut. And when they get together with you, whatever they're feeling or thinking inside, you will see and hear outside. Now, very quickly, what I'd like you to do is based on those simple descriptions, where would you put yourself? I mean, most of the time with most people, do you feel that you come across mostly guarded? If so, pick a one. Mostly open, pick a four. A little bit of both but more guarded, you'd pick a two. A little bit of both, but more open, you would pick a three. And by the way, as you're picking your number, just a couple of quick things. How many of you uh, through college, let's say, have more of a technical background, technical training? Can I see your hands? Technical, technical? All right, do me a favor as you're picking your number. Pick a whole number, not a 2.5 or a 1.7, all right? And uh, uh, the second thing, I know some people are saying, Tony, it depends, you know, uh, if I pick my number at work, it's one number. If I pick my number at home, it's a, a different number. All right? How many of you do, in fact, project a different number at work versus at home? Can I see your hands, please? All right, we call that schizophrenic. <laughs> hey, but don't worry about it, okay? Notice I capitalized the word behavioral. And the reason I did that is that is a key word. This is not, as some people uh, claim it is, this is not personality styles. That is a misnomer. This is behavioral styles, personality, much more complex, much deeper, much more difficult to change. But behavior, how easy it, is it to change your behavior? Very easy. I can behave one way at work, a different way at home. I can behave one way at work with my colleagues and a whole different way with my employees, uh, another different way with my customers. So behavior can be changed. So back to the question, can you have a different number at work versus at home? The answer is yes. That's adaptability, all right? So decision number one when I'm dealing with people, and I, I only ask you to pick a number in a letter but uh, I'm not asking you when you are kind of sizing somebody up, whether it's in person or on the phone, or even in their emails, whether they're more open or guarded. Don't pick a number, one, two, three, four. Pick just open or guarded. Now, the second and final decision, I try to make this simple as possible. When I was going, growing up, going through school, I always challenged my teachers to do two things. Number one, I, make it simple. Get out of the, the, the clouds, get out of the theory, make it simple so I understand it. And then second, once I understand it, how do I use it? Make it practical. And that's what I try to do. Simplify and make things practical. So second decision we want to make about people. Is the person coming across more direct or indirect? Now directness is pace. So direct people faster paced, indirect people slower paced. Direct people more assertive, Indirect people less assertive. Direct people impatient. Indirect people more patient. Indirect people tend to ask. Direct people tend to tell. When it comes to risks, decisions, change, indirect people approach all three more slowly, cautiously, and methodically because indirect people have a tremendous inner driving need not to be wrong. And as a result, they check, they double check, they do their homework, their research, their due diligence, they want to make sure 
that they are not wrong in the decisions they make. Now, direct people, when it comes to risks, decisions, and change, they approach all three more quickly, decisively, sometimes even spontaneously, because their inner driving need is to accomplish and achieve as much as possible, get it over with, what's next? Now, could you imagine when these two people work together, the direct people, the indirect people, and neither is adaptable, what could happen? They drive each other crazy. How many of you are married and believe that your spouse is the opposite side of this scale? Can I see your hands? Yeah, it makes communication a little bit tougher. Not impossible, but tougher. Uh, oh, by the way, when it comes to rules, indirect people follow the rules according to the letter of the law, whereas direct people follow rules according to the spirit of their interpretation. So where would you put yourself on this scale? If you're very indirect, most of the time with most people, you'd pick an A. Very direct, you'd pick a D. A little bit of both, but more indirect, a B. A little bit of both, but more direct, you would pick a C. And everybody should have a letter and a number. How many of you are here, sitting here, with somebody you know? Can I see your hands? All right, well, quite a bit of people. It would be interesting to kind of lean over. Uh, I'll give you just... 10 seconds, just lean over to somebody who you think knows you and ask the person, let's just do with a number, what number they would pick for you. See if they pick the same number that you picked for yourself. Do it real quickly, 10 seconds, let's see how close you come. Okay, let me ask you a question. How many of you, upon asking your colleague what number he or she would pick for you, they pick the exact same number that you pick for yourself? Can I see your hands? Exact same number. All right, how many were one number off either direction from what you chose and what they chose for you? How about two numbers off? How about three? Because we have a special session for you afterwards. <laughs> no. All right, so now let's put it all together. All right? So, one of my three objectives was how do you identify somebody's behavioral style? Will you identify somebody's behavioral style by making two either or decisions? Is the person coming across, based on what I see in here, verbal, vocal, visual, more guarded or open? And is the person coming across more direct or indirect? Those two decisions. So what it does is it leads me to the four basic DISC styles. DISC is just one of dozens of four style models that are out there, but it is the most popular. In fact, DISC is the single most widely used online assessment in the world. Uh, so let me ask you this. How many of you chose as your number a one or a two combined with the letter C or D? A one or a two combined with a C or a D. Can I see your hands, please? All right, you are the high D style. Sometimes we call them directors or drivers, all right? I'll tell you a little bit about yourself in a second. Just hold on one minute, okay? Patience, please. How many of you chose as your number of three or four combined with a C or a D? Can I see your hands, please? All right, our socializers, party on. All right, those are what we call the high eyes, the, the high influence styles. The ones who probably were out the latest last night partying. How about a three or a four combined with an A or a B? Can I see your hands, please? Our related, relators, our amiable patterns, right? Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, and finally, a one or a two combined with an A or a B. Can I see your hands, please? The more analytical thinkers, they raise their hands a little slower because all the facts are not in. <laughs> They're still analyzing this. Okay. So. Let's talk a little bit about each style. I said there were three objectives I had. One objective was to show you how to differentiate who's who by making two simple decisions, either or. The second is understanding what makes each of these styles tick. And obviously, because of their incredible impatience, I will start with the Ds. Where are my Ds? Can I see your hands, please, my Ds? All right, look around, the Ds, their key desire, results, bottom line, their motto, I want it done right, I want it done now, or better yet, I want it done when? Yesterday, they're in a hurry for everything. They tend to juggle a lot of things at the same time and do them well. They're great 
uh, administrators, delegators. They work best under pressure, under deadlines, and they play to win. Another motto for the Ds. Winning isn't everything, it's the only thing. Rarely, if ever, will you see a D playing a game for funsies. Oh, let's not keep score. Yeah, forget about it. They always want to know, how are we doing? How, if we're not winning, if we're not in the lead, how do we get there? They play to win. Now, I will tell you this, of all four styles, Ds are the weakest listeners. Let me repeat that for you. Ds are the weakest listeners. But there's a reason they don't have time, and they already know the answer. Why listen? Let's talk a little bit about their strengths and their struggles. What are their strengths? They're great at taking charge, making things happen. They like challenges. They like confrontation. They, they thrive under pressure and confrontation. Uh, as I said, they juggle a lot of things at the same time. But if you want to ensure bottom line results, give it to a D. What they struggle with is their patience. They're very impatient people. They get impatient if you are not moving in the agreed upon right direction as quickly as they think you should. They're not diplomatic. They call a spade a spade. Some people say they're blunt. They say, I, I just call it as it is, as I see it. Uh, weakness is listening. Uh, but they're quick to delegate, but slow to instruct. When they delegate something, they typically look over somebody, hey, hey no, that, that, that's not the way to do it. Let me show you how to do it. The, they, they delegate and then tell people why they're not doing it right. So those are the Ds. Where are my eyes? All right, their key desire, fun, excitement, applause, visibility, recognition. And as a result, they talk a lot about their favorite subject, themselves. Generally speaking, the eyes are generally speaking. They have the gift of gab, the power of persuasion, the ability to get other people more excited about their ideas than even they are themselves. It's sort of like they're the verbal Pied Pipers. Positive thinkers, sunny disposition, uh, many of them charismatic people. Problem area is they take on too much, get overwhelmed, and cannot finish it. When all is said and done, this is another saying for the eyes, when all is said and done, more is often said than done. Now, what are their strengths? They think very quickly on their feet. Very optimistic people, positive thinkers, very persuasive. And if you want to promote anything, whether it's a product, a service, an opportunity, an idea, a company, a person, you give it to the eye. What do they struggle with? Formal reports. What do they tell their sales managers? Hey, do you want to report or do you want to sell? I can't do both, pick one or the other. They're not great at details. They tend to round off and oftentimes round up. Uh, they're impulsive. Uh, they tend to leap before they look. You know the old saying, ready? Fire! Aim. And once they do something, they don't like to redo it. Where are my S's? S's, their key desire, harmony, safety, security, close personal one-on-one -on -one relationships, the true people, people, loyal, reliable team players. So, show me a marriage where one of the parties is an S, and I will show you a long marriage. Not necessarily happy, but long. <laughs> Problem area with S's is, is uh, they say yes to a lot of things. Even when they want to say no, they say yes because they don't like to rock the boat. They don't like to hurt people's feelings. So they, they take on so much, they get under stress. They're like a martyr. They take on everybody's issues, everybody's problems. What are their strengths? As I said, friendly, sensitive, great harmony to relationships and teams, a great team player, by far the best listeners, great at coordinating and cooperating, but what are their struggles? They do not like competition. Why? Because somebody has to lose. I mean, just think of their feelings. Feeling like they're a loser. Can't we
we have a competition where everybody wins? Well, is that a competition? I don't know. Uh, they don't like change. They do not necessarily delegate because, again, as I said, they take on more things on their own and they lack a sense of urgency. They want to make sure everything is right before they dive into a task or a responsibility. Finally, where are my C's? C's, their key desire, order, accuracy, precision, perfection, their motto, everything in its place, and a place for everything. Their patron saint, Spock from Star Trek, or Sergeant Joe Friday from Dragnet, just the facts, just the facts. Uh, these are the great planners, problem solvers, organizers. They're great at creating systems. They're highly inventive people. Here's a good one. Of all four styles, they are arguably the most intellectual. Michelangelo, Da Vinci, Einstein, C's. Good thinkers, good analytical thinkers. So if you want something done right, give it to the C, to the thinker. But if you want it done on time, Think again, because they procrastinate until it's what? Perfect, often suffering from paralysis by analysis. What are their strengths? Quick to think, slow to speak. You will see in a group setting, they don't say a lot at the beginning of the, of the meeting. They're taking everything in, they're analyzing, they're evaluating, and then as the meeting progresses and they get a good handle on what's going on and what's been said, what, what's not been said, then they start asking questions and participating. Great at accuracy, problem solving skills, and organizing. Sometimes they even plan spontaneity. <laughs> Their struggles, they don't like to work with unpredictable people or in any kind of disorganized environment. They don't necessarily work well or play well with other people because others don't have the same sense of precision and accuracy that they do. They don't like confrontation. They will avoid people and avoid situations rather than confronting it. And uh, they don't make timely decisions because uh, if all the facts and all the data is not in yet, they don't make a decision. Now I wish I knew about this when I was in school. How many of you were taught this when you were actually in school? In school. I mean, look at this, like five hands at most. You know, in school, they tell you uh, that I'm gonna, well, we're gonna teach you the, the three R's, right? The three R's, reading, writing, arithmetic. These are educators saying that these are three R's, reading, writing, arithmetic. Uh, but they don't teach you relationships. I wish I knew this when I was in school. It would have helped me with my friends, would have helped me with my classmates, certainly would have helped me with teachers. When a teacher likes you and you're on the borderline between a B and a C, you're more likely to get the B and when they don't like you, you're more likely to get the C. But I wish I knew this when I was in grad school. I was in the MBA program at the University of Connecticut. I met another student there. She was from New London, Connecticut. I was living in the Bensonhurst section of Brooklyn at the time. Now, if you look at a map and you look at Brooklyn and then you look at New London, Connecticut, as the crow flies, we were really close right across Long Island Sound. We were close. Yeah, forget about it. New London is part of Connecticut, Connecticut part of New England. New England, a very different regional culture than New York, right? Although Connecticut touches New York, it doesn't want to. <laughs> now, not only did we have this regional difference, we also had an ethnic difference. Me, New York Italian. She, English and Dutch. I gotta tell you, I didn't realize how big a cultural gap that was until after we were married. <laughs> and we had the big uh, celebration, family get together on her side of the family in Vermont. And it, it, was, it was incredible because here were all these relatives greeting each other with handshakes. What is this handshakes family? I tried to hug a couple of them and they, they froze like this. But in all fairness, it was a much bigger cultural shock for her at my family reunion in Brooklyn. Because how did they greet? Hugs and kisses. 
Some of them even took advantage of it, but hey, that's another story. <laughs> then when her parents wanted to come visit us, they called first. We were living in Pennsylvania at the time. They wanted to come visit us. And I said to her, why are they calling? She said, well, they wanted to make sure that they weren't inconveniencing us or putting us out. They wanted to give us plenty of notice. Family? That wasn't my experience. Of course, when my parents came to visit us in Pennsylvania, the doorbell rang, and there they were. Well, I got to tell you, my ex-wife had a very difficult time with that. Very, very difficult. But I wish they did teach this uh, when we were younger. All right, let's talk about adaptability. How do you adjust your style to match, to complement the style of the other person? Well, let's start with the easy thing first. Task versus relationship. With the two styles up top, the C's and the D's, I want to focus on the task, focus on the job at hand, and only develop the relationship with them if they initiate it. If they don't, it's all business. The two styles at the bottom, the S's, and the eyes, I want to chat, I want to talk, I want to socialize, I want to build the relationship as the bridge before I get down to business. The two styles to the left, the C's and the S's, I want to slow down my pace. And the two styles to the right, the D's and the I's, I want to speed things up. Does this make sense? This is the easy thing. Do I want to focus on the task? Initially, the task or the relationship. And do I want to slow down or speed up depending on the individual? Now, let's talk about two things. For each style, I'm going to give you two pieces of advice. The first piece, when you are the D, this is when you are the D, or if you know a D and want to convey this to them, this is how you can actually change your behavior in general to come across as more adaptable. Then the second part is going to be, how do you sell to a D? And we'll do that for each of the four styles. So when you're the D, try to let people do things without always looking over their shoulder and trying to tell them that they're doing it wrong. No, here's the way to do it. Uh, try to participate in any kind of group without feeling that you have to be the leader or the boss. And praise people, give compliments. In fact, one of the rare times you will hear a D verbally say, well done, is when they order a steak. Now here's the interesting thing about Ds. Here's the interesting thing about Ds, and Ds please listen to this. You actually think compliments. It's just getting it from the thought phase to the verbal phase. Uh, it, is, it is a bit difficult. I am a D myself, so that was always an issue for me thinking a compliment and then saying it. Because thinking it, I would say, Everybody, yeah, she knows that. You know, why do I have to say it again? Uh, but it does work, you know, so just verbally say it. Now, when you're selling to Ds, here's a few little tips on what to do. Uh, keep the relationship businesslike. Make sure you are prepared before you talk to them. Do your homework. Uh, when it comes to having them make a decision, Give them two to three options with a brief cost-benefit summary. And if they have a problem, respond to it quickly. Now, I have a couple of these in here to show you how each style does things differently. The same activity. Now, just based on what I've talked about so far, has anybody in here ever had to actually fire somebody? Anybody? It's not a nice task, is it? But, do you think that each of these four styles, the D, I, S, and C, would handle that responsibility differently? What do you think? Absolutely. Let's take the S. By the way, who would you say is the least likely to fire somebody? The S. They don't want to hurt people's feelings. So here's what an S would do. What's your first name? Arturo. 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 Okay. So let's make believe, Arturo, you work for me. You come uh, into the office, I have to fire you, all right? I'm an S, here's what I might do. Arturo, please come in, sit down, have a seat. Just wanna know how is the family, everything going well? Look, you've been with us 90 days, and we have a policy here. After 90 days, we do uh, an employee evaluation to see how well they are performing based on the job responsibilities that we've asked them to do. So I wanna ask you, Arturo, how do you think your your actions, your behaviors, uh, 
are matching up with the job responsibilities that we talked about. Now, what, what the S is hoping for is that Arturo will break down, cry, and quit. <laughs> but what if Arturo says, well, I think everything's going great. Uh, why do you ask? Oh, no, no, we were just interested. No, no problem, Arturo. No, go back. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. Uh, they, they just hope. That's how an S fire somebody, hoping, at least initially, that somebody's going to quit. And when Arturo leaves, what does the S do? Calls a D. The D says, Arturo, come on in. And don't bother sitting down. <laughs> Boom, it's done. The C, Arturo, please come in, sit down. You notice on the table in front of you is a sheet with uh, two columns. On the left-hand column where the job responsibilities we talked about on the right-hand column is uh, your actual uh, behavior. Uh, and all the way to the right of that, I have put the percentage deviation between performance and... <laughs> Whoa! Okay. And the I. How does the I fire somebody? Hey! Hey, Arturo, come on in. I got great news for you. New job opportunity. Not with us. Uh, <laughs> oh, boy. So, when you are the I, write things down. Work from a list. I have a daughter who is an I. For years, I had to work to get her to write things down. Finally, one day at work, she's writing things down. Problem on different pieces of paper all over the house. Get the less appealing tasks out of the way early on and pay attention to your time management. When you're selling them, let them set the pace of the meeting as opposed to you. Be a little, little bit more animated and enthusiastic. Slow to criticize, quick to praise, and quick to praise in front of other people that are important to them. And make sure that when you're finished, you summarize everything in writing. Who's to do what, when, where, how, and why? How does each style handle the monthly checking account? How many of you get monthly checking account statements, whether it's uh, 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 digital or, or hard copy? Uh, now, when the monthly checking account statement comes in, who will balance it that day to the penny no matter how long it takes? The C. The day it comes in, the D looks at it, goes to a C, and says, look, I'll pay you 20 bucks, you do it for me. <laughs> Delegating again. The yes, the day it comes in, they wait for that evening to balance it as a family bonding experience. <laughs> the I, the day it comes in, why do they keep sending this? What is this? And how can I be overdrawn? I still have checks left. <laughs> when you're the S, stretch a little bit more. Get out of your comfort zone. Take on different responsibilities. Speed up things. Get into your actions and activities a little quicker. It doesn't have to be perfect. And try to desensitize, desensitize yourself to what other people say or do because your feelings get hurt very easily. Sometimes it, it's not about you. It's about something else. Now, when you're selling to S's, build trust before you build business. If you're asking them to make any kind of change, show them how the change will benefit them and everybody else who's affected by the change. Hand-holding, personal guidance, personal assurances, and predictable personal service. Of all four styles, this is a style that wants more face-to-face, ear-to-ear uh, contact with you. Uh, we see this, don't we? This is a great place to watch this, how each person waits for an elevator or deals with an elevator. The D. It doesn't matter if the button is already lit and pressed. They go up and keep pressing it, thinking that it's going to make the elevator come faster. And they complain. I can't believe this. Where is this? Look at this. You know. Whereas uh, the S just stands there patiently smiling, maybe humming a song. The elevator comes, everybody gets on it. The I potentially turns to everybody and says, I guess you're wondering why I called you here today. <laughs> the C is all the way in the back of the elevator, counting the number of people, estimating their weight, and looking to see whether they're going to stay on the elevator or get off. <laughs> when you are the C, what do you want to do? Modify your criticism. Now, when I say criticism, oftentimes it's just your look. All right? 
Check only the critical things, not everything. And engage in more water cooler talk. When you're selling to C's, you're not going to do a lot of social talk or schmoozing at the beginning. You're going to get down to business while you're there. Logical options, as many as possible, with data, documentation, proof, all right, studies. Of all four styles, these are the ones that may say, I need to think about it, I want to sleep on it. And if you push too much, you push them away, not toward a decision. And make sure that if they do business with you, there is a, a very specific timetable that they, are, that they know and you know and you follow it for measuring how well you've achieved the results that you told them you were going to achieve. How, do each, how does each style learn something new? Let's say uh, uh, something new uh, in HubSpot or some new piece of software. How do they learn something new? Well, the S is, what the S is like you to do is to explain one activity, you explain it. Then you do it, show them. Then let them do it, give them feedback. And when it's done correctly, you move on to the next thing when they're comfortable with it. One thing at a time. You explain, you show, you let them do it, you coach them through it, and then you move on to the next thing. C's, give them the manual. And oftentimes, let them teach you. Uh, the eyes, they like to jump right in. Hey, what's that button? Boom! Races everything. Uh, the Ds, all right, I just want to know one thing. How do I do this? Show me how to do this. Go away when I want something else. I'll call you. One thing at a time. So, I know uh, this concept is much deeper than 45 minutes could, uh, could handle it. And I used to give 100 speeches a year for God knows how many years. Uh, sort of burned out on all these live programs. So uh, jumped into digital or virtual training. Uh, if any of your colleagues or your company wants to dig into this a little bit deeper, there is my DISC virtual training that focuses on sales, leadership, team building, etc. cetera. Uh, it's at drtonyvirtualtraining.com. Very interesting program. Uh, those of you who would like an extended deck of slides. Now, I know I've given permission for this presentation to be put online uh, at Inbound and the PDF of these slides. But if you want an extended deck of slides, much deeper than what I covered here, just email me, aja at alessandra.com. That's aja at a-l-e-s-s-a-n-d-r-a, -S 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 one L, two S's. Uh, in the subject line, Simply put inbound 2015 so I know to send you these slides and not some other presentation slide. Uh, by the way, my D's and my C's, where are you? Please, D's and C's. Uh, all I ask you to do, if you want the extended deck of disk slides, just send me an email, put inbound 2015 in the subject line. You don't have to do anything else. I'll take care of it. Right. Where are my S's and I's? Can I see your hands, please? Right. I want you to do the same thing, but send me a message. I'll read it. All right, make me feel good. Uh, last thing, ladies and gentlemen, let's see how well you can take a concept that we just talked about and make a decision about something that we haven't talked about. The ideal vehicle for each style. Whether they can afford it or not. It's the vehicle that you would say, you know, you're an S, you're an I, you're a D, you're a C. That's you. That vehicle is you. You know how sometimes we say that about people and their dogs? Dog looks like the person. What would you say is the ideal vehicle for an I? A convertible, all right. What color? There it is. Oh, I love that. And you know why eyes love, well, we know why they love fast cars, but why they love convertibles? Because when they stop at a light, it's easy to talk to people on both sides. Hey, how you doing? Hey, hey, how you doing? Uh, ideal vehicle for an S, the relator, a minivan. Sure, bring the family, the kids, the dogs. Ideal vehicle for a C, the more cerebral type, a Volvo or a Prius, you know, a car that makes sense. 
And what about the ideal vehicle for an impatient get out of my way D? <laughs> Although this is not street legal, this is. So ladies and gentlemen, here's my contact information. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.